so f- as far as my dad, it was very much from the day one, Channel, Channel Islands was a partnership, my mom and my dad together. And my mom played a huge role. And my mom is super business savvy. She was a bookkeeper until the day she retired. No way. Yeah. Crazy. And she ran the retail store for years and years and years and years. And all the business decisions were always my mom and my dad together. So my mom deserves, when it comes to the business end of things, a huge amount of credit. Um, She was really amazing at that. And they were great partners. What's her name? Terry. Terry Merrick. And she's a mother to many. Anyone who's ever worked for my mom loves her. Um, So, and then beyond that, my parents are really, really committed to integrity and treating people well. So they always took care of their employees. They always took care of their vendors. And they were always honest about their dealings. And they dealt with people in a way that was kind and generous and honest. And they had integrity in their business dealings. And I think in the long term, that kind of thing pays off. You know, I mean, I would hope we live in a world where it does. I'm not sure sometimes. Yeah, I know. I mean, truly. Yeah, no, I, I t- and I totally get what you're saying. And I think as someone who's trying to kind of live in a similar way as them, I struggle with that at times because I look at the success of others who I know are not integrous and I know are not doing those things, things that way. But there has to be a, a sort of a higher impetus that propels that. But that was their thing, like integrity, honesty, generosity. Those are the things that they practiced. And then my dad just refused to ever be satisfied when mm. it came to surfboards. He just refused to be satisfied. It could always be better. It could always be better. Um, and that was that driving, artistic, creative, craftsman thing. And he certainly took that to business. Like, we can go further. We can go further. And he did the hard work. I mean, my dad tells me stories about the early 70s and making a bunch of boards from beginning to end, loading them in a van and driving them to the East Coast to try to sell them. And walking into surf shops, cold turkey in 1974 to be like, I'm Al Merrick. This is a board I built. I've got a van load of them. Will you buy one? You know what I mean? Like he did the hard work and that's commitment. So I think they brought those um, characteristics and qualities and values to the business. And then I think a lot of it also, though, was uh, serendipitous or Mm. fortuitous. I mean, so Sean Thompson in 1977, fresh off winning a world title, comes to Santa Barbara because he wants to surf Rincon, starts to ask around, who's a hot shaper? I want a board for Rincon. Oh, well, that's Al Merrick. So now my dad in 1977, you know, eight years into the business, nine years into the business, is shaping boards for a world champion, right? And learning. Sean brought my dad the first twin fin my dad had seen. Sean had a twin fin that he conned MR into making for him. MR didn't want to make him a board because MR and Sean were competing. Sean finally got a board from MR, brought it to my dad. My dad started making boards based on that at Rincon and Zoom. And then again, Sean in 1981 had got a thruster off Simon Anderson, brought it to my dad. Look at this. My dad had never seen a thruster. Started making thrusters, testing them at Rincon. At that same time, there was a young Tom Curran. It was a perfect time to transition a young Tom Curran from the twin fin to the thruster. And that was a huge one, right? The Al Merrick thruster developed around Tom Curran was like a thing. You still see design characteristics of it in short boards today. But to have Sean Thompson and then a budding Tom Curran, and then only a few years later to have Kelly Slater come on board, those are like magical, fortuitous, serendipitous um, things, you know, and those happened. And I think any real success story has those in them, right? There's got to be a bit of magic, luck, blessing, sovereignty, whatever you want to call it in there somewhere. And they certainly had their fair share of that. Yeah, I wonder, it's interesting, it's a bigger conversation, but I wonder how much of it he wills, your dad wills to himself too. Or attracts, let's say. Through all those good deeds, through all those good business dealings and like integrity and all that stuff, you know, it sure. there's a karmic attraction to yeah, it. Yeah, there has to be. I want to believe there is, right? Yeah. I want to believe that doing the right thing pays off. Yeah. 
Yeah. I was raised that way. I was raised that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I am going to embrace, though, is never to be satisfied. I mean, never. To, that wasn't the word you used, but. That is the word I used. Oh, was it? He said that to me explicitly when okay. he was teaching me to shape. So he was teaching me to shape, and I make a good board, and I get all stoked, and he would say, don't ever be satisfied with yourself or your boards. Yeah, I'm going to embrace that. It could always be better. Now, there's a really cool side to that, and there's a shadow side to that. Right, the shadow side is um, that then you only feel as good as your last board. And as a young man and as a kid, I watched my dad struggle with that. When the boards were working great, he was on top of the world. When they weren't, it was very difficult for him. And I experience that same thing now, right? So because I've taken on that same value, um, I, sometimes I feel I'm only as good as my last board. So when I get negative feedback or a team writer's not stoked or the boards just aren't clicking, that's like affects me deeply. I don't sleep. I don't feel well. On the other end of it, when they are clicking and the boards are working good and people are stoked, I'm really, really happy. And there's somewhere in there where I'm probably assigning too much value to both ends of that equation. Mm. Right. So I think a place of balance and health and wholeness is somewhere a little more in between and not living on the extremes. But I think that greatness is often discovered, lived out and manifested on the extremes. Totally. Right? Back to our favorite podcast of Disgraceland. Those are podcasts about greatnesses that ended in destructive places because of their greatness, perhaps. You know what I mean? Oh, he's got another good one called the 27 Club. Yes. Oh my gosh. About <laughs> everyone who died at 27? It's freaking crazy. Dude, it's freaky. It really is. I remember when I was 27 thinking, okay, I'm going to for sure die. <laughs> you thought you were, you well, thought you, you belonged. you know when in your mind you're a rock star, but you aren't. I was you in were the, in the I, pantheon I of like <laughs> Kurt Cobain and Jim Morrison oh and Janis gosh. Joplin, yep. Amy Winehouse. Wow. Jimi Hendrix. This is quite Keith the reveal. Moon. Yeah, this is a reveal. Yep, I was in the pantheon. So anyway, you know, uh, I think you have to have that thing that drives you. Um, but that can be difficult to live through and live with. Difficult for your family to live with. Yeah. I mean, if you're, you have everything and you're still unhappy. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm unhappy. Um, but I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm deeply affected when boards aren't going well. Yeah. And deeply, deeply satisfied when they are. And I think for me... There's, there's well-being and wholeness to find a, a middle place. You know what I mean? 